Good afternoon. <clears throat> At the outset, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Bansi and the entire DICARE-CON team for this an honor. Uh, really privileged to be part of this conference year after year. And uh, Bansi is always, we are very, very close friends and is like a younger brother. So it's an honor to get some felicitation coming from Bansi. Thank you. So what he has asked me to talk about evolution of CV outcome trials in diabetes. Uh, I'm sure we all know that approximately 50% of the people with type 2 diabetes still die from coronary artery disease or CV mortality. And diabetes and CVD, if it is there, or diabetes with any amount of target hormone damage, or if there are more than three risk factors, it comes out to be a very, very high risk for getting another episode of CVD, and that is why ASD 2019 said that if you have an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or indicators of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart failure or presence of CKD or reduction in uh, EGFR, then we should use drugs like SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonist, which have a demonstrated CVD benefits. So let's see how these recommendations are coming and this is what I'm going to talk with this brief context setting that why today we are choosing drugs in a particular setup or in a particular profile that if you have an established disease, GLP-1 comes out to be much better. If you have incipient heart failure, maybe drug like uh, SGLT2 inhibitors will score over other drugs. So there is a rationale for uh, all these recommendations and it comes from lot of clinical trials which have happened over the last 30 years. The earliest one were UKPDS, which talked about metformin role, which significantly reduces myocardial infarction, all-cause mortality by almost 39 to 40%. Accord said that the effect of tight glycemic control or CV complication may be ranging from some amount of neutral to possibly harmful effect. That means it said that if you're targeting a CV risk reduction, a very tight glycemic control may not help. Actually, it may increase the mortality. And the TZs from the proactive study, 5,000 patient data with the pyoglitazone talking about improve several CV risk factors if you are using drugs like pyoglitazone. And it also reduced the second principal MACE endpoint by 16%, unfortunately. The primary outcome didn't reach a p-value wise significance, but ultimately there was a reduction in three-point MACE by 16%. So even early days, that time, unfortunately, we didn't have CV outcome trials, but the wisdom came from UKPDS trial on metformin. We at least became wiser that if you can have a tight glycemic control, you can reduce significantly the microvascular endpoints. And of course, a court telling us that if you have a established disease, someone who has diabetes for close to 10 years and you attempt a very tight glycemic control, you may do more harm. So 2007, a meta-analysis of 42 studies on rosiglutazone said that it increased the risk of myocardial infarction. P-value wise, it was very, very significant. And these incidents were related to rosiglutazone, rosiglutazone which then subsequently prompted a FDA announcement in December 2008. It is then that since then we have the all CV outcomes coming because this became mandatory that if you want to launch a drug, the guidance for industry is that any patient who needs to be on anti-diabetic drug, we must evaluate the cardiovascular safety before that drug can be launched and before that drug can be used in clinical practice. So FDA said that if that drug is a new drug and it is to be launched, sponsor must demonstrate that therapy will not only result in an unacceptable increase in CV risk. So this was for the first time, 2008, FDA said that any drug which has to be launched, it has to be at least CV safe. And that is based on the fact that if you have a pre-marketing analysis which tells you that cardiovascular risk is not more than 1.3, safe way it can be launched. If it is anything between 1.3 to 1.8, then obviously you need to have post-marketing surveillance on that 
to make sure that that drug will not increase the cardiovascular event because that wisdom came from the Rossi Gluteus own. So in this guidance for industry, FDA 2008 said that meta-analysis strategy should use phase two as well as phase three data. There has to be a blinding of central adjudication of all CVD events in phase two and phase three. We must include high risk subjects, those who have advanced CVD, those who are elderly or those patients, those who have CKD, and there has to be a minimum exposure of two years in a large CV outcome trial, and approximately you need to have at least 15,000 patient years. So it was a very, very strong recommendation which led the foundation for having all the CV outcomes. Now let's see how do we interpret a CV outcome trial. There are three common ways. One is to assess the time of occurrence of a cardiovascular outcome. That means you're talking of MACE 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then there has to be a survival analysis. And third is that you, at the end, tend to summarize all these trials based on certain statistical methods, which need to be predefined before you start that trial. But then there is a word of caution that there could be a misinterpretation of statistics, which can affect clinical practice because differences in baseline cardiovascular risk levels of population are there. So all trials may never have that homogeneous type of population. You cannot uh, compare what happened in examine or in survival trial versus say empiric trial. Those were absolutely heterogeneous types of population. So it is very, very important that we take into account the differences in the study design. This is very important. The length of the follow-up and the underlying population characteristics before even comparing two trials on a similar class of drug, like say declaratimi, cannot be compared versus Amparec or maybe uh, other trials because populations are not identical. There has been an evolution of drug therapies. I'll not go into details of that, which of course I told you why that FDA alert came. And since then, 2008 FDA guidance, there have been 15 CV outram trials in total, and six out of them, they have demonstrated CV benefits. These are all CV outcome trials on DPP4, GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGLT2 inhibitor. Manoj was just talking about carbos because that drug is, a, drug is already introduced in the market for 28 years. I think it came somewhere in 1995. That time there was no uh, FDA mandate that you have to have CV outcome trials or pregnancy data or CKD data. That is why even if we agree today that a carbos is a good drug, but you don't have a data and now it is off patent drug, obviously no company is going to invest on that. So that is what is the story behind all CV outcome trials. But it is important to see that even over last uh, close to 20, 16 years now, since 2008, none of these trials, they have reported an increase in risk of any major CV outcome. So MACE increase has not been demonstrated in any of these trials, whether are these, these are with DPP-4, SGLT2 inhibitor, or GLP-1 receptor agonist. Even if they have included a uh, population with had and organ damage, like examine, Elixa, Emparec, 99% already patient had some coronary event. So obviously this was a very high risk. So was the severe TME. So these trials fall into the different categories based on the fact whether there is already an end organ damage, there is a, some vascular uh, dysfunction is there or there are only multiple CV risk factor the way you see in Declare. That is why I said that these trials are not to be compared because these populations are too heterogeneous in terms of overall design of the study. And this is what is the landscape of all these trials over last 16 years. I'll not go into the details of individual trial, but just to give you a snapshot of all non-insulin CV outcome till date, starting from declared to me, which is a primary cohort, only multiple CV risk factors are there, 40% patient having only a established cardiovascular disease, credence, which is primarily a group where this patient already have diabetic nephropathy, Carmelina group, which means patients already have a cardiac as well as a renal dysfunction set in. And all these studies, these are the balloons. They, these green are SGLT2 inhibitor, red ones are DPP4. 
orange one or GLP one is septuagenous, and the balloon size is dependent on their population. So you could see that Declare has one of the largest population uh, because there were 17,000 patients. So if you sum it up, Declare has the same number of patients what you have seen in Amparag as well as in the, uh, what is that, C Canvas trial. So now different class of drugs, they have been used in different CV outcome based on a hypothetical mechanism, a mechanistic mechanism that this drug is, it is not something that any drug you start and you put into the CV outcome trial, most of those trials will fail at the end. If you're too ambitious, the what, what happened in CVR trial, they thought that we are going to have a superior ad outcome. The design was wrong. The model of that study was wrong. Had they targeted a non-inferior trial, it would have been a very good trial. So you need to have a mechanistic basis of that particular drug. So based on that, these drugs have been gr uh, grouped together and trials have been planned. So when you talk about drugs like EMPA, CANA, DEPA, or itroglyphalazolin, these are primarily aimed to reduce heart failure hospitalization. HHF, because we know moment you start a drug like SGLT2 inhibitor, they are going to work in a hemostatic mechanism and there is going to be reduction in hospitalization with heart failure maybe as early as 28 or 29 days. But when you are talking drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonist, you know that there are going to be only the benefits in terms of three-point mace reduction in those patients, those who have an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, because based on earlier molecules or same members of the family, we know they are not going to work on reduction in hospitalization with heart failure. Similarly, when you are using drugs uh, like GLP-1 receptor agonist, they are primarily going to reduce albuminuria. That is how they are going to reduce three-point mace and renal outcomes are going to improve, but as such, reduction in uh, that uh, renal composite endpoint, which could be a 40% reduction in EGFR or overall doubling of serum creatinine. Different trials have different uh, criteria That's, that has not been seen with GLP-1 receptor agonist. But when you sum all these trials together, CV benefits are either in the form of three-point mace reduction or a four-point mace reduction. I'll be talking of four-point mace also, what is the genesis of now having a four-point mace, and we know SGLT2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist, they have worked better in terms of getting some reduction, p-value reduction, which could be a significant or a non-significant reduction in three-point mace and the metabolic benefits and the renal composite benefits. So these drugs again can be charted based on their beneficial effects on CV outcome. So when we talk of hospitalization in heart failure, obviously the benefits have been demonstrated in Emparec trial and in Canvas trial, and it was neutral when it comes to drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonist. So that is why it is neutral. When we are talking of three-point mace reduction from these drugs in terms of three-point mace reduction only, not reduction alone in hospitalization with heart failure. Again, if you talk about me, it was neutral. There was only 0.7% reduction in three-point mace, which p-value-wise was not significant. But when you talk of these drugs, these drugs were neutral because they were all DPP-4-like drugs. So based on their proposed mechanism or a hypothetic mechanism, these drugs have been uh, grouped together. And that is how you plan a three-point mace or a four-point mace-led uh, CV outcome trial. Now, primary endpoint in CV, earlier CV outcome trial, since 2016, all these trials, they were on three-point mace. And most of these, I told you, they have shown some benefit in three-point mace reduction. In conclusion, an individual drug may be mechanistically differing in impact on CV outcome. Some drugs, GLP-1, they are working primarily through atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease-based reduction, drugs like G uh, SGLT2 inhibitor are primarily working in getting benefits in terms of getting pre and after load reduction. So there is going to be reduction in hospitalization with heart failure. But overall, three-point MACE is generally likely to offer the best balance, if not the gold standard. And in this regard, three-point MACE appears to be much superior than having 
a four point maze which have been now incorporated and these are uh, uh, like including hospitalization, heart failure, revascularization, need for revascularization, or maybe unstable angina. So these are another three points which have been incorporated in different trials when we say it is a four point uh, mace in that particular drug. So when we navigate the mace in cardiovascular outcome trial, an important le lesson learned is that classical mace endpoint may not accurately capture the magnitude of morbidity and mortality. CV benefits of GLP-1, I told you are primarily through atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease mechanism based. SGLT2 are primarily working through hospitalization and heart failure. CV outcome results have also highlighted the major role of heart failure per se, which is independent of established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And future studies should focus on the potential synergistic benefits. Now, these days, we are talking of getting dual agonist, tri -agonist. We are trying to combine drug SGLT2 inhibitor with maybe future uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist and trial based on that so that we can have some amount of synergistic benefits. Now coming to four point maze, why it is important, whether it is going to be useful. Fourth point maze is now either we include uh, 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 hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, right? Or a need for revascularization over next say five years or 10 years. Outcome out, uh, heart failure outcomes in CO outcome trials with SGLT2 have tested close to 38,000 patients in different class of these drugs, whether you talk about EMPA or DEPA. The magnitude of benefit from SGLT2 inhibitor on MACE was absent or modest relative to the larger magnitude of hospitalization and heart failure. And unfortunately, despite the fact the largest benefits were seen on reduction in hospitalization with heart failure. Still, it has not been indicated primarily for use of SGLT2 of late now that now you have DAPA mentioned as first drug if there is a heart failure irrespective of the cause, it should be the first line option or could be a fourth pillar after other drugs. So a absence of heart failure Label indication is largely due to heart failure not being a primary endpoint. This was because of the fact that till now we didn't have all the CB outcome. They were not talking of heart failure hospitalization as a primary outcome. That is why the clearance on that drug was not there till we had DAPA heart failure, right? So the future direction for heart failure and non-primary endpoints in cardiovascular outcomes will be that we must ensure that the proportion of patient with baseline heart failure is reflective of the prevalence of comorbid heart failure in routine clinical practice. That means if you're talking of prevention of hospitalization, heart failure by 35%, let's see how much is the prevalence, how much benefit is going to come, whether this is a important comorbid situation in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And another important thing that when significant effects of agent on heart failure are likely or anticipated, trials should be conducted among patients, those who are at a greater risk for heart failure. Only then you will come to know that there are going to be exceedingly high benefits and then only you can use that drug in the future. Now the second fourth point mace could be an unstable angina, which whether it should be included in the primary endpoint. Well, of late only heart failure hospitalization with unstable angina has been included in few trials, but unfortunately there are not many trials which have included hospitalization with unstable angina. Another important thing is that when you include hospitalization with unstable angina, it definitely, definitely adds to the numbers. So it may get you the CB outcome trial stoppage maybe in one year time rather than doing for two years. You need at least 625 or 628 events before you can close a CB outcome trial. I'm sure we all know that. That is what is the genesis that there is going to be a significant reduction in three point maze. So if you add hospitalization with unstable angina, numbers will come up fast. So you might be able to stop that trial early, but CB outcomes with these glucose lowering agents have minimal impact on hospitalization with unstable angina. That is why if you make it a four point maze, it will not add any value as far as overall profile of that uh, drug is concerned in terms of reduction in 
four point maze that is why the primary outcome of three point maze to me it seems may offer a better balance than a four point maze where you are adding only hospitalization with uh, unstable angina as the fourth uh, maze component so another important thing is that when you try to incorporate all the benefits what we get in amparic trial declare or other trials we in routine clinical practice if i ask you how many patient have incipient heart failure out of a overall garden variety of patient not even 20 percent all those patient those who have an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease even in these large registries of close to 19 lakh patient is less than 18 percent that means even if you are trying to push a drug with the benefits in terms of three point maze reduction it may not be for entire 100 percent of population your 20 percent patient or less than 20 percent patient may only benefit from a particular type of drug maybe even ampa gliflozilate another important registry that is a uk database has shown that even 15 percent not more than 16 percent patient actually belong to this high risk group where we are advocating a drug like glp1 receptor agonist or maybe a drug like sglt2 inhibitor so what they have done is these days it is an era of computing that you obviously you cannot have 19 lakhs patient incorporated in any study today it is very difficult to carry even 4000 patient for three years and to run that trial because it comes out to be billion dollar uh, for that research so what they have done is they have used a real world and modeled an impact of glucose lowering therapies in recent cardiovascular outcome trial that means a cohort of about maybe this was a cohort of two lakh patients out of that only 60,000 patients were excluded and our diabetes was there in 1,82,000 patient and they tried to put those patients into either empiric trial or into the lethal trial and they saw that 26 percent will be eligible for empiric trial and 48 percent patient will be eligible for lethal trial based on their inclusion criteria I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Two lakh patient picked up in a particular cohort and based on that computed model, based on those inclusion criteria, you have tried to put those patients either in empiric trial or into the leader trial and then you try to evaluate the benefit whether there are going to be benefits coming out of that trial. But when we, these days we are talking of not only CV outcome trials, we are also talking of trials in terms of renal composite endpoints, doubling of serum creatinine, renal death, need for hemodialysis or any other cause which could be attributed to the renal cause. So we have seen that with the drugs like SGLT2 inhibitor, there is a close to 35 to 40 percent risk reduction in renal composite endpoint. But then there are challenges when you try to incorporate CKD in a CV outcome trial. There are certain patient related factors. There are other confounding factors like uremia and other biomarkers which are going to be very, very high. Like if I give you an example, anti-proof BNP every day we do these days in hospital, in every patient who comes in emergency, it comes out to be early days we were talking about 250 level and 750 level, patients are getting up to 20,000. Yesterday there was one patient of mine got admitted to almost 27,000 anti-proof BNP. But mind it, if patient already has a heart a CKD where there is end stage renal disease EGFR is already less than 15 these values become less meaningful so there are going to be uh, more complexities when you try to get CV outcome benefits in a CKD population so when we are planning a chronic uh, kidney disease outcome trial we need to have a precision medicine approach treatment should be selected with a mechanism of action known to modulate that pathophysiological target of the interest, biological markers that can actually predict that the pathophysiology is present, which can be identified and validated subsequently, and identify those patients with marker of interest. That means this marker is high, so this may reflect better in these patients, and then conduct these trials. Then there are issues with CV outcome trials because minorities have never been represented. It is of late that now you are getting certain trials where there are Indian patients because it is mandatory. Tomorrow they have to launch a drug in India. If you don't have an Indian population, you will not get a DCGI license. 
otherwise earlier trials they never included indian population they were talking only of the caucasian population so how can you say that the benefits which have been seen in caucasian patient will also reflect in our ethnicity it has been seen same is true about us patient they have the highest amount of mortality and prevalence of diabetes when it comes to black africans but unfortunately as compared to the white caucasian or hispanics but unfortunately not more than 5% of them they have been included in various trials this might be because of the fact that they are underprivileged people they have poor literacy they probably don't have adequate knowledge they cannot come back regularly and there there might be so many other reasons so we need to incorporate those patient those for whom we are going to advocate advocate a particular drug in that particular ethnicity at least in those minorities those drugs should be tested then towards the end i must tell you whether all cv outcomes are equal and whether there are uh, way to compare them directly cv aims to cv outcome trials aims to demonstrate that addition of a novel agent is as safe as usual care that is what is the aim when you start that trial first thing is efficacy and safety that it is non inferior to placebo right second is in this current era of primary multiple risk factor management cv events rates are very very low these days every patient is on standard care they are already on aspirin high dose statin they are already on as arb so it is very very difficult to get benefits coming in those patient that is what exactly happened in declare there was nothing wrong with dapagliflozin versus empa empa got a 38% cv death reduction and 35% reduction in hospitalization with heart failure which could not be replicated in dapa declare because it was a primary cohort they were not at a greater risk greater is the risk better are going to be the benefit so if that patient is already on all standard care everything you are already given beta blocker statin aspirin and uh, antiplatelet drugs and uh, good glycemic control any other drug on top of that it is very very difficult to demonstrate any amount of benefit coming out of that cv outs are are primarily safety trials because first thing you want to launch a drug you want to prove it is safe that is why it is better to have non inferior trial rather than aiming superior trial that is what happened with savity me and it failed in that experiment then there are limitations of cv outcome before we close whether these are required today there has to be a uh, lack of generalize general, generalizability current cv outcome include participants who are at a high risk we must have primary cohorts in every cv outcome trial to say that there is going to be some risk reduction all these trials are very short time trials they last only for 2 to 3 years because a pharmaceutical industry will not be able to sustain a trial of 10 years because of cost again it is very very short time to get side effects coming out of that drug pio we are not sure whether there was an increase in bladder cancer until unless you follow for 10 years time and unfortunately all these trials are placebo designed trials so even if you have a euglycemia doc mina other day you were discussing in one of the studies that when you have a euglycemia coming whether we can compare the benefits even if you compare it versus placebo a anti diabetic drug will definitely score better over placebo in terms of not only getting a glycemic control even if you target 6.8 to 7 so ideally it should be against a active comparator only then you can say that versus that active comparator there are more benefits with that particular drug or drug so there are opportunities to improve upon the cv outcome trials primary intervention trial should be also there in low risk population that is a first thing not only for high risk there should be longer trials ideally of course industry may not be able to support that and ideally it should be against an active comparator and the standard definitions of important safety and micro est outcome uh, till now we have been talking of only cv outcome trials we have not been talking of micro est benefits coming in these trials which were earlier demonstrated as early as ukpds trial almost uh, 20% reduction 35% reduction in uh, microangiopathy so now 2020 us fd came out with a new guidance it said that it is time to relook into our earlier guidance which came in 2008 when it comes to safety of these drugs 
size of the safety database, I'll just close in one minute. Uh, at least it should have 4,000 patient years of exposure of the new drug in phase three clinical trial. It must have 1,500 patient, those who are exposed to that drug for at least one year. At least 500 patient, those who are exposed to that drug for two years, 500 patient should be at least of CKD. There have to be at least 600 patient with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and at least 600 patient should be older than 65 year of age. Then only probably we'll be able to put it rightly that this drug is going to be safe and a debate which always is there whether these should be abundant. I think trials should be still sustained. There has been a recent crescendo in enthusiasm for real world evidence, but we all know we have been part of so many real world evidences done by pharmaceuticals or other agencies. Nothing comes out of that because there's no, not a core data. It's most of the time a soft data. I'm sure these cannot replace a CV outcome trial. And real world approaches, they get you some benefit in terms of pharmacovigilance. Once it comes to post-marketing surveillance, you have to prove whether it is 1.3 or 1.8. The requirement to assess each anti-hyperglycemic medication in at least one large scale randomized control trial is there before we can approve that drug. So I think CV outcomes are still very, very relevant because it is noted when we are talking of CVD, we, and important thing is I said, not only we should talk of macroangiopathy, we must talk of microangiopathy, which is equally important in these patients. New and existing glucose lowering should be drugs should be evaluated for their overall effects on vascular health, not in terms of micro and macro. We have our own hypothesis and our publication. We say it is a continuum. So micro is as important as is macro. CV outcomes have sensitized diabetes care providers for the opportunities for multifactorial and comprehensive diabetes care. That is one thing which has come out of the CV out trial. These days, whenever we try to pick up a drug, first thing is we look into the profile of the patient. Our own guidelines talking about, last slide, ABCDFGH approach, whether you have CKD presence, whether patient is elderly, whether there are other risk factors, and whether this drug is going to do any benefit. And CV have embraced comprehensive cardiorenal primary endpoint. That is what has been the advantage of overall CV outcome trial. These days we are talking of a care me, where it is cardiorenal and metabolic approach. We want to reduce OSA, we want to reduce overall progression of MASLD, renal composite endpoints, as well as cardiovascular endpoints. So these trials are very, very important, but these, again, we need to sit back and again uh, look into the strategy for having a long-term CV outcome trial. Thank you very much for your patience listening, and thanks a lot, Thank Dr. Bansi. And